All right. Well, let's pray and then we're going to get into the word. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for saving a wretch like me. God, you have given us life and life more abundant. And today we just want to praise you, God. We want to worship you. And I want to make sure that I'm always following after you. God, I pray that you would lead us in the paths of righteousness by still waters and make sure that we're getting nourished where we need nourished. That spiritually, Lord God, we are always pressing on. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Directly for Sue. Man, I think God would have really spoke to Sue if she would have just showed up for church today. But in that, you know what we're doing? We're rejecting the truth. Because that truth is for me. That truth is for you. Examine yourselves. He says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, not your wife, not the one that didn't show up, not somebody out there on the street, not a family member who you wish would have heard that. This is for you. This is for me. I need Jesus. I need the word of God daily in my life to correct me, to change me, to purge me. This isn't for somebody else. It's for me. Examine myself. Know you not that your own selves... Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates or discredited is what that means. But I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates or discredited. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Boy, we should all be able to say that as followers of Jesus. We can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection or your maturity, your completion. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. He, Paul even told him, he said, man, if I was, I'm writing to you, but if I was there with you, I would use sharpness. And that sharpness isn't for your destruction. It's not to harm you. It's to build you up. It's for your edification. That sharpness was like, man, I'm serious. And you need to be serious. You need to get serious about your salvation. If Jesus isn't the first thing in your life, then he's the last thing in your life. If he's not the first thing in your life, he's the last thing. He's the only thing that can save you. When we look back at verse 5, he says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That word is parazo, which means to scrutinize and try. How many times have you went home and actually scrutinized your own faith? Because that's what he's saying we need to do. I need to put it to the test. To make sure that my faith isn't in vain. Amen. I need to go home and every day I need to scrutinize my, my faith. Make sure that I know that I know that I know that I belong to Jesus Christ. I need to test my faith. Try my faith to make sure that I'm really in it. And then he says, prove your own selves. Prove your own selves. That word prove means dokumazo which is even a stronger term, and it means to test as to metals. It literally means to test your faith. Don't just examine it. Don't, don't just make sure that you know that you know that you know, but put it to the test. Think of a blacksmith. He has to test the metals that he works with. A blacksmith can't just go and look at the outside of metals and know the quality of the metal. He has to put it in the fire. He has to get it hot. He has to make sure that, that all of the impurities are coming out to even know the quality of the metal that he has to work with. And that's what the scripture is telling us to do. Test it. Prove it. In my opinion, that's the type of examination and testing that we need to do in our own lives. I believe we need to allow the conviction of the Holy Ghost to come, on, come upon us so real that it is life-changing. 
that it's uncomfortable. Without the pressure and the heat, do we ever really get purged? If our faith is never tested, is it really faith at all? I believe we've gotten so soft and easily offended that the maturity in the church lacks. There's no healthy rebuke. There's no deep accountability to where we can speak the things of God into each other's life sharply without worrying, man, I don't want to offend Dylan. Man, I have a word from God and I have a, a correction for his life and God is speaking to me to speak to him, but I don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't want him to get offended and go somewhere else and I won't be able to speak into his life. That is not how we should operate in the kingdom of God. If he's out of line, I should be able to speak to him that he's out of line. If I'm out of line, you should be able to come to me and speak to me that I'm out of line. And that conviction should draw me to repent and change. But we get so easily offended. We walk around almost looking for some reason to get offended. That offense causes disunity, and it causes you to never find a place where you can call home. Because you're always going to be offended wherever you go. Until you can look inside of yourself, until I can look inside of myself and say, I need to do something different. I need Jesus to purge this iniquity out of my life. I need this dross that has been embedded in my heart for so long to come to the surface and be completely wiped away. Galatians 6, starting in verse 3, it says, For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, who does he deceive? himself. Here's what matters. God matters. And God knows your heart. So when you think that you're something that you're not, you're not duping the people around you. They don't even matter. There's one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy both body and soul in hell, and it's God. And he knows your heart. So when you think you're duping everybody around you and you can live a double life, you're only deceiving yourself. It's you that's hurting, not everybody else. And he says, but let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. It isn't about just what I have going on internally, but what's happening externally. He says, let every man prove his own work. Let him examine his own work, his actions, his deeds, what's happening in his life. And if I can do that, and I'm honest with myself, then guess what? I can have rejoicing in that. Amen. Not in somebody else's work, not in somebody else's salvation, not in what God's doing corporately, but in my own life and in my own work of what God's doing in me. It goes well beyond just examining ourselves, but examining and testing what we do. We know all of the things that we do with wrong motives will be burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. In my opinion, here's, here's how I think of that. If what I'm doing is with the wrong motives or wrong intent, and it's going to be burnt up in the end anyway, why waste the time? What benefit does it do to do something with the wrong motives? Nothing. You're doing it for naught. At the end, it's just burnt up like wood, hay, and stubble. There is no eternal effect to it. The things that we truly do for God, when we truly embrace what God's doing in our lives and we truly submit to him and we listen to him and we, we do things on his behalf, there will be real rewards for you in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul warns us about taking communion. He talks about the body of our Lord Jesus. He talks about the, the blood of Christ and he goes on to warn us that if anybody takes communion or takes the, the body or the blood of Christ in an unworthy manner, he says unworthily, he says he will be guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. In my opinion, that should be super sobering to all of us. If we fellowship with God and commune with God and we do it in an unworthy manner, we're now guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. Why in the world does that not wake the church up? Why is it, isn't that so sobering that it changes our perspective on everything that we do in Christ? If I do things unworthily in an unworthy matter, and now all of a sudden I'm guilty of the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ, that should be a wake-up call. 
You know, we read that kind of flippantly with communion sometimes, and we talk about it, but I think that it should wake up the church, and we should see how serious our salvation is. In the Old Testament, is it just me or is it hot in here? It is hot. I'm not going to. <laughs> Thank you, AJ. In First and Second Samuel, we see David as a young boy. A young man who knew the authority of God. He knew the promises of God. And then you have Goliath. You have this uncircumcised Philistine who was just full of anger and rage and violence, who was the best of the best. He was their champion. And you have this young little shepherd boy who knew the authority of God in his life. In my opinion, he probably looked, looked around at the army of Israel and thought they were a bunch of cowards. He said, you're supposed to be here on behalf of God. What are you all doing? So give me the arm. I'll go out there. And he went out on behalf of God, and he knew the authority of God. He stood before Goliath unafraid. Eventually, young David was anointed king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. And although he had experienced victory, the authority of God and the promises of God come to life in him. Eventually, he found himself bound in iniquity bound in sin. David looked upon Bathsheba just a little too long. Now remember, this was a man after God's own heart. His lust turned into adultery. His adultery turned into murder and lies and deception and all of these things to where King David, this man after God's own heart who is an authority of God, now is so deceived by his own sin that he just keeps doing more and more and more, hardening his heart deeper and deeper into sin. And what happens? God sends Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet speaks these things, this little riddle. And he says, what, what should happen to this man? What did David say? Kill him. He should die. And I believe Nathan looked at him boldly and said, that man's you. And David, being king, had all the authority to have him killed or kill him personally right there on the spot. That's what most of us would do. We'd get offended. How dare you? You don't speak to me like that. Don't you know that I'm the king? I can have you killed right now, right? We have all these reasons why we don't receive the conviction that God sends into our lives. Usually, that conviction is through another person. Isn't it? Sometimes... God will send a conviction into your heart. Sometimes it'll be his word. But a lot of times, God will send somebody to come and speak into your life that conviction. And instead of David being offended, instead of David being full of rage and anger, he wept and repented before God. It was almost like the scales were just instantly removed from his eyes and his heart was immediately softened. And he said, I've sinned against God and God alone. And he wept bitterly. I love the heart of David. A man who experienced the deception of sin and how easily it can destroy somebody's life. Yet after he experienced the conviction and the real repentance, everything in his life was so real and intimate that he said, I don't even want to set anything wicked before my eyes. In Psalm 139, David pours out his heart He says, search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. He says, try me, test me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way inside of me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. He knew that he needed God to search him. He needed God to be able to reveal those things. If he had any sin, any iniquity in his heart, in Jeremiah 17, it says that, that our hearts are wicked. They're deceitful. Who can know them but the Lord? I don't even know my own heart. It takes God in my life to be able to expose the things in my heart that I need exposed. And so King David, an amazing man of God, says, search me, O Lord. Try my heart. 
Why has the church fallen so far from this? Instead of examining ourselves, instead of going after Jesus day after day after day, just, Lord, search my heart. If there's any wicked thing inside of me, please show me. But instead, we're, we're offended. We're sensitive. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. I don't know about you, but I need people telling me what to do. Outside of God and the body of Christ, my flesh can be super deceiving. I could fall into this place where I think the Lord is moving in my life, and it could be something else. And I think that we're all vulnerable to that. We need the body. I want to remind everybody that that conviction comes from God for a purpose. It's a beautiful thing, and we're called to embrace it. In Hebrews, it warns us, don't be like basically those fools in the rebellion, in the provocation, where they just rejected the conviction all the time. And he warns us, he says, pretty soon, reject the conviction long enough, and you won't hear it anymore. What a scary place to be in. When we are able to process spiritually the conviction of God, it leads to change and unity. When we try to process those things in our humanness, in our flesh, it leads to offense and disunity. I know that there's nothing good in me outside of Christ and Christ alone. So in order for me to abide in God's plan for my life, I need to keep myself out of the equation and as anybody else, I have to be very intentional about that. Sometimes it's easy to, to pollute the waters a little bit. Well, it's Jesus, well, and a little bit of my desire. Well, it's Jesus and a little bit of what I want. It's only a matter of time before what I want becomes more than Christ. I don't want that in my life. The best I could do outside of Jesus Christ was 17 years of meth addiction, 21 years bound by pornography and sexual sin. The best I could do outside of being born again was waste 30 years of my life. And I was stubborn, strong-willed, prideful as you could be. And I could do nothing good in my life outside of Christ. That conviction, that conviction that the Holy Ghost uses in our life draws us to Christ. It causes us to look to Christ. But offense... Offense causes us to look at ourself. It's selfish. It's all about me. It's how I feel. It's how I think. It's putting myself back in the equation and rejecting what God wants. Offense is not of God. If you want to be offended, be offended at sinful things. Be offended at the things that are offensive to God. In John 3.17, it says that God sent his son into the world. Not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So that offense, that selfish way of looking at things, it leads to long-term condemnation. It's just a snowball effect. We end up condemning ourselves, condemning others. We fall into this place where we are without God. We're godless. In Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless... I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. No longer is it I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. Is Christ offended all the time? Is Christ sensitive to the things of the world all the time? We need to buck up. If you haven't noticed, the world isn't getting any better. And if we don't allow our skin, our spiritual skin, to be a little thicker, we'll fall by the wayside. We need the conviction to grow. We need the conviction to mature. We need the conviction to be able to be purged of these things that are not of God inside of our life. We need to stop being offended all the time. That offense is a trap. When you're offended, it's a snare from the enemy. Your own emotions, your own thoughts, your own feelings get involved and they end up separating you from the rest of the body over and over and over until it's like a lion 
who goes after a, a herd and he separates the weak one, the slow one, and has his way with it. Bow your heads with me. I would just ask you, if that's one of the things that you struggle with, if you struggle with offense and being sensitive to the things that, that happen around you or that people say around you, please, don't wait another day. That offense is going to destroy you. I would ask you to just come up to the altar and lay all of your offenses down. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I hope that every one of us, before we leave this house today, have all of those things set aside so we can hear clearly the things of God in our lives. If I can get some men to come and pray with these men and some ladies with these ladies. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for being so faithful. God, I thank you for the conviction. That conviction reminds me that I'm a son. It reminds me that I'm a child, a joint heir with Christ. I don't ever want to turn away from conviction. And Father, I pray that the church would embrace conviction, that we would embrace correction and re rebuke and reproof. I don't want to harden my heart. God, I pray that you would have your way with us today, that you would move so intimately in each one of our lives, Lord, that we know, that we know, that we know that we're in the faith. And I pray that our life would be a life of examination. That we would test and prove our own work to make sure that the things that we're doing, the things that we're, we're giving our lives over to are the things of God with good motives and good intentions. The rest we know will be burnt up so, Father, I just pray that you would change our hearts today. That you would take our lives and transform them. And above all things, that through our life, the name of Jesus would be lifted up. That all men would be drawn to you. We praise you, Father. We give you all of the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. I love you guys.